Welcome back to Documentary First, an inside look at a documentary filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Jason Rugg, and joining us, as always, is our documentary filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey, Jason. Great to see you. Great to see you. And we're also joined today by a special guest who's probably been on the show more than any other guest, uh, Joe Amaday. Thank you. How you doing? Hey, Joe. Happy to have you back. Happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is becoming uh, you know, something that I really look forward to each time. Yeah, it's so great to have you here. Uh, today, we actually have an hour's worth of recording. You just got back from Cannes. You have a lot to talk about. Uh, I can't wait to hear it all. Before we begin, I'm wondering, we're going to switch it up a little bit. If you could give your own bio just really quickly of how you would describe yourself. Ah, uh, um, I guess the, you know, film lover, film geek, um, uh, born with a reel of film in my hand. Uh, I've been in the business since the days of VHS. That sounds like a very, very long time ago because it is, uh, but kind of grew up in the business working first at the first video store in Philadelphia where I, where I'm from. And then working my way through a few studios as a, distribu as a distribution sales rep, and finally taking over as president of a company called uh, USA Home Entertainment. That was a film distribution company where we released movies like uh, Steven Soderbergh's Traffic, uh, Being John Malkovich, a whole bunch of great indie films, Robert Altman's Gosford Park. Um, and I was very fortunate that I got to work with those filmmakers on the release of their film handled special features and commentaries and got you know directly involved in all of that kind of stuff and built a good reputation for someone who likes to work with filmmakers um uh, one of my my biggest thrills was in a conversation with the board at usa and robert altman robert altman referred to me as the guy that's not the suit <laughs> So anybody that's in the business knows what that means. And I've cherished that description of me all the way up until today uh, because we do like to work with filmmakers. Everybody, we're having a little bit of a technical um, problem here. So if we sound or look a little bit different, uh, we apologize, but we're just going to keep rolling uh, right forward here. So, Joe, thank you so much for, for giving us your bio. I'm sure most people listening know who you are, but um, we're so thrilled to have you back. And uh, Christian, I'm going to hand it over to you. Yeah, well, you know, I'm glad you did because I did want to give full disclosure here that Joe is our distributor for The Girl Who Wore Freedom. He's also going to be distributing our next film called Heroes of Carenton. Uh, I absolutely love Joe, and I think the fact that I want him on our podcast uh, is a huge testament to the kind of guy he is um, in one of his bios, which I don't know if it'll make it in this cut or not. Uh, Joe, you were telling a story about being in a boardroom. Why don't you tell that story again real quick? I got you guys. <laughs> were you doing that on purpose? Wow. Joe. For Joe those listening, hey. Joe, was just, Joe was just mouthing like he was talking for a solid 10 seconds. I was, I was on... <laughs> I'm sorry. I was on a board conference call um, over um, uh, regarding a film called Gosford Park. And there was, you know, a lot of executives on that call. This is well before the days of Zoom. And people were giving Robert Altman a hard time because he wanted the poster to be, you know, not have any pictures of stars. And the, and the film was kind of star studded. It was the film was the uh, you know, kind of like, um, well, it, it had won it had won a couple of Academy Awards, and it was kind of the Downton Abbey of the day. That type I remember of movie. It. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I think Downton Abbey is written by the same person. So, in the middle of the conversation, you know, it came to me, and 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 I was like, well, at the end of the day, you know, it's it's Bob's film, it's Altman's film, and he knows what's best. And Altman blurted out to everyone that he really appreciated working with us at USA and in particular working with me because I was not a suit. Yes. And I knew what he was referring to. And, um, and I've, I've cherished that remark until that day, until today. 
Um, I'll give you a very, very quick side note on Gosford Park. I was very, very fortunate, my wife and I, to go to the Oscars that year. Wow. And Gosford Park was nominated for a bunch of Oscars. And we were even more fortunate to go to the Governor's Ball, which is pretty exclusive. So we, we go to the Governor's Ball, we sit at a table. I'm sorry, let me back up about an hour and a half before that. Gosford Park wins the award for best writing. So we get to the we get to the governor's award dinner, and I go, and my wife and I, we sit down, and I mean, it's every star in the world is at the ball, and they only go to the governor's ball for about ten minutes, fifteen minutes, because it's very boring, and then they go to all the cool parties, which we did not get to go to. But anyway, we sit down at the table, and there's this fake Oscar sitting on the table, and I pick it up, and I'm waving it around, thank you so much for this Oscar, and I hear behind me a guy say. Uh, excuse me, sir, that's my Oscar. And it's a real Oscar. And it's the guy from Gosford Park that wrote. <laughs> and I'm waving his Oscar around. So I sheepishly, is that a word, handed him the Oscar. He was a, a really good chap and left. And uh, I sat down pretty much embarrassed. So that's my Oscar story. <laughs> what did the what did the Oscar feel like? I've always wondered like what it was like. You know, the awards are the, the thing about the Oscars and the Emmy, I've been able to hold them both, um, is they're very heavy. Yeah. Uh, when people say they use them for paperweights or to keep doors open, no door stops, it's true. <laughs> they're very, very heavy. Wow. wow. That's and obviously funny. at that point they're not inscribed or anything like that. The the inscription actually comes on a plate that is screwed into the award. Mm -hmm. Ah, very cool. All right. Well, we're not here actually to talk about the Oscars. We're here to talk about something much more exciting, well, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Um, you just got back from Cannes. It's another place I've always wondered about. I'm desperate to go. I really would love to go next year. Um, and there's a lot of people that, you know, have heard about Cannes. They know what it is. Other people have just heard the name. They don't actually know what it is. So I was wondering if you could just educate us. I know there is the Cannes Film Festival. There is the Cannes sure. Film Market. Um, why don't you talk to us about the whole landscape, what it looks like, what its purpose is, what people are there, and tell us any fun stories that happened this time. Sure. It's, uh, you know, Cannes, it's, it's kind of hard to describe. It's you know, it's it, it's on the the southern coast of France. It's along the Mediterranean. It's a picturesque, uh, coastal, beautiful town filled with amazing outdoor cafes and incredible looking sights. Um, looking out in, into the Mediterranean, it's usually filled with yachts and all kinds of boats. It's on it's on a harbor, so there's a beautiful harbor that is you know right in the center of town um and it's a vacation spot for you know for people that live in france that's where they go like new jerseyans would go to atlantic city only it's a little bit different so you know this very small little coastal town you know all of a sudden 25,000 35,000 people show up and it becomes very very crowded and and that's one of the things that you take from when you visit the film festival and the film market is it's very, very crowded. There's a lot of people there from all over the world. But it's it's also a very important market for filmmakers. So as, as you just said, there's really two things going on, all in the same buildings, all in the in the same area. There is the Cannes Film Festival, which has been going on for I think it's 76 or 77 years right now. And it is a, you know, all out film festival, just like any other film festival, large or small, that happens here in the United States. Only this one has a series of steps that they put red carpet on. And when they premiere a film, the stars walk up the red carpet. At the bottom of that red carpet are, you know, 500 paparazzi and a, a thousand <laughs> fans that have come to Cannes just to see the stars walk up the red carpet. I've only had the opportunity of doing that once, and that was a long time ago where we had a film um, called The Third Wave. And The Third Wave was a documentary about a bunch of volunteers that met um, at the luggage counter um, in Sri Lanka when, when there was a tsunami that actually came in and covered um, 
cover the entire country. So these volunteers from all over the country, all over the world converged to help out the folks down there. And these bunch bunch of people met guy from Australia, two people from New York City, a guy from from uh, Denver, Colorado. And they all met. And they all went to this little town that had been devastated and stayed for a year to help rebuild the town. So the third wave was really, you know, the tsunami had two waves that came in. And the third wave was the wave of volunteers. So somehow one of the filmmakers, the director of the film, got the film into the hands of Sean Penn, who at that year, at that time, was the head of the jury at Cannes that year. And he said, we want to show this film. Wow. So we had a full-blown world premiere at Cannes. Um, I had produced a film along with Morgan Spurlock, who had made Super Size Me, and his partner in business, Jeremy Chilnick. So we, you know, put on the tuxedos and we walked up the red carpet. They, you know, we heard, heard our names announced and showed the film and went to an amazing party afterwards. And it's one of those moments in my career that we will never forget. Uh, and it is also the only time I've put on that tuxedo and walked that red carpet because like the Oscars, it's an all day affair. Um, it takes, you know, from the time you get there to the time that movie starts is a good two hours. Uh, the non-stars are the first people to enter the building and then you wait. And it's just a very, very long night. And so the film festival exists and it's, it's, it's very um, exciting. And it's, again, it's star driven and it's a combination of American stars and more importantly, European stars, because we are in Europe. So it's it's so it's mostly uh, uh, a lot of French actors and directors, and it's 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 great um, to watch well, from so, afar. Yeah, when I went to Sundance in 2019, uh, I went. You know, it was one of those storied things where you hear all the time about Sundance, and you have no idea what it is. You don't know where it is. You don't know you know what happens there. It's just there's a lot of stories there because you know stars go there. And I decided to go, but I didn't think for a second that it was actually really true that I was going to see stars or there was going to be many people there. But it was a crush of people, you know, in Park City, Utah. And, you know, it was this beautiful, picturesque little town. Everything was very small. I bumped into, um, you know, so many different people that were stars. I just I mean, and literally bumped into them. Um, Stanley Tucci, I almost knocked wine out of his hand. So, you know, you just, it, I just never expected it to be that way. And I've heard that can is really compacted. Like it's not yeah. sprawled out. It's very small. And that One you theory. Can, can bump into people. You know, not like Sundance. There's a, there's, there's a big difference. Um, there are no Q and A's after films in can, they oh. may introduce the actors mm -hmm. from the audience. They'll stand and wave. And that's it. Hmm. Um, unless it is a huge film, like this year they premiered Indiana Jones and they gave Harrison Ford a special award. So he was on stage. The They interview or they premiered the new Scorsese film, Killers of the Flower Moon. So because you have someone like De Niro and DiCaprio there, they came on stage and they waved. That's it. Oh. There's no audience Q&A. There's nobody sitting there afterwards. Um, and then... Uh, for the most part, those actors go home. Wow. Meaning they get on a plane and they get the heck out of there. You're very rarely bumping into them at restaurants or wow. anything. So you know, and this year we did I we did see Ethan Hawke um sitting having dinner. You know, you might walk by somebody, but it's not even a case, it's not even a type of film festival where you would feel comfortable walking up to those folks. Huh. It's, you're just not there for that. Mm -hmm. Um wow. yeah, it's it's not. And then that could be the European flavor of things. It's the same in Berlin. Berlin also has a film festival that's the same way. You know, they have a red carpet premieres in a beautiful theater on Marlene Dietrich Boulevard. And they leave. They get on their planes. You know, they stay. They stay in the hotels that no one can afford to stay in. And then they go home. They're not frolicking along the beach the huh. next day. 
Well, um, yes, yeah, Sundance is very different because I guess totally it's different. much more totally. American. Like oh, yeah. you have workshops and you have Q and A's and you have meet and greets and you have like every little production company has their own party and you know you have press meeting rooms and you have bands that are there and you know the stars are walking on the street. So it sounds very American as opposed to to Can. Then yeah, you don't see that. I mean, this they have they have the the meeting rooms and they have the um conferences and stuff like that can you know can does but only only a very small bit because the market handles all of those other things that you're talking ah uh, so, so you how have the do you get, how do so, you get tickets to the actual film festival and to see yeah. the films that are there so you there's a, a couple of different ways of getting tickets you can buy tickets off of their website as soon as they become available good luck um <laughs> It's in par with getting a Taylor Swift ticket. It's just, you know, it, well, it's and almost they're, impossible. They're seven hours ahead of us, too. So when they hit, well, they're yeah, seven hours yeah. ahead central time. So when they go online, my guess is the Europeans snap them up very quickly. Yeah. So what, what, you, what you'll see, um, and it's crazy, is along the, it's called the Croset, the boulevard that, that the theater is on. You will see, and I'm not I'm not exaggerating, dozens of people in their tuxedos or the most beautiful women in the world in their gowns, as if they're going to premiere, holding a sign that says, please, can I have a ticket for whatever movie is about to premiere? So during Indiana <laughs> Jones, you couldn't walk around the city without seeing somebody with a sign saying, need one ticket for Indiana Jones. Oh, It's hysterical. <laughs> Um, I, do those people I don't ever know, get tickets? People. Do they get tickets? You know, um, I. So let, let, let me let me let me get to the end of the story. In the old days, up until a couple of years ago, if you bought a market badge, you were able to go into the market, and they had these kiosks. And forty-eight hours before that movie premiered, and let's use Indiana Jones for example, you would you would be able to log on. And if they were available, you were able to get a ticket, okay? And that ticket would either be for that premiere, for that premiere, or the following morning they would show the film as well. But you, you would always go for the premiere. Now, if you didn't go to that premiere, if you didn't show up, they knew it from the, num the, the number on the ticket. And you try getting a ticket for another film. They really get angry because they want every seat to be filled. So there have been times years ago where I had tickets and it might not be for a film like Indiana Jones, but sometimes you get to that kiosk and you're just picking any film that's available. And then you find out you can't go and I've given tickets away. Not a lot, but I have, I have done it. And it's, you know, you hand, you hand one of these folks a ticket and it's like, you've just handed them a ticket for Taylor Swift. You know, they want to buy you wow. dinner. They want to, and you just kind of give them the ticket, keep, keep on walking. Wow. So, so you have the film festival and, and again, it's like Sundance. It's like Toronto. It's like Berlin. Um, it's like any other film. It's like the, you know, Austin film festival, but then at exactly the same time on the same dates is the market, the Cannes film market. And that's, what's important to filmmakers, not the film festival. I'm going to be very clear about that. We go to Cannes every year, not to attend the film festival, but to attend the film market. Same as Berlin. We do not go to go to the Berlin Film Festival. We go to visit the film market. And what the film market is, quite simply, is imagine a convention in a convention center that we've all been to. It could be a Christmas convention. It could be an auto show. It could be a, a home and garden show. But instead of booths that are selling rakes and and tractors, it's a booth selling movies. And these booths are from all over the world. So one whole section of the convention floor will be the Italian pavilion, and it's all the Italian companies. Another section will be the Spain pavilion, and it's all the companies from Spain. All of the distributors, multiple distributors. And think of every single country in the world, with the exception of North Korea, um, Iran, Iraq, and nowadays Russia, because they're not coming either. 
and also a host of European countries and American countries. So there's literally hundreds of booths. And not only are there booths in the convention center, but all of the hotels and the apartments fill up with other companies that are representing their titles. So as you're walking down this beautiful croissette, you have the Mediterranean on the right, which is absolutely stunning. And then on the left, you have this series of um, um, high apartment buildings and hotels with people taking over suites and they hang their banners out so everybody can see, oh, that's where that company is. That is that co that's where that company is. And you schedule meetings with all of these people, all of these companies for two reasons. One, to see the films that they have that you might be able to pick up to represent in North America if you're a North American distributor like we are, or if you have your own films that you need help on internationally and you want one of these companies that are um, experts at selling across the world, selling into Germany, selling into Japan, selling into Australia. Well, so does that mean I can go next year and try to sell The Girl Who Wore Freedom? You can. You'd be better off selling your new film. Yes, but I still think I can sell The Girl Who Wore Freedom, especially in France. You could. Yeah, you could. Well, you could. Joe, I'm going with you next year. You so, can take that so, to the bank. <laughs> so, so to go to Cannes, um, obviously you need to book a flight and you need to get a place to stay. And the, it, is, it is expensive if you want it to be expensive. And it's not expensive if you don't want it to be expensive. But be prepared that, you know, a one-room one bedroom, very small, old flat is, you know, it's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars for, for eight or nine days. Wow. So, yeah. So there are no hotels. I mean, there are hotels, but you're not going to stay in them because they're 2000 a night, you know? So you're renting flats. So you're heavy duty Airbnb, heavy duty VRB, whatever oh, it's called. VRB. Um, yeah. Heavy duty, heavy duty. And that's what everyone does. And that's what everyone's been doing forever. I have I think I stayed in a hotel once, and that was my first year. And that's when I was working for a, a big company for USA. So um, to get the badge and to get the badge that will enable you, I'm, I'm sorry, and then also throughout the day at the all of the local movie theaters in Cannes, and there's three or four of them, but then also in makeshift screening rooms, in the convention center, which in France is called the Palais, there's probably 20 different theaters that are showing movies from 8.30 in the morning till 9 at night, one after the other after the, after the other. So if in turn you were trying to sell your film, you could have your film screened there and people could go see it on the screen. We almost did help that you for sell the girl who wore freedom. You can that, do that. Yeah. That well that you almost did it. I think it was yeah, right during COVID yes. or something. Yes. So that's an option too. So as a distributor, you're going there and your time is spent seeing movies, seeing parts of movies sometimes, and a whole slew of meetings. This year we had there was three of us that went and we had, I don't know, 33 meetings, I guess. Um and then it takes a couple of weeks to go through all of the information that you gathered while you were there to watch a lot of the links that they have sent you, um, make decisions on if you want to try to get a film. And they're doing the same thing with the films that you gave them. So there's three markets that are consequent, that are big. There is Cannes, there is Berlin in February in Berlin, and then there is AFM that tries to do the whole thing within a two hotel uh, block in Santa Monica. And that is in November. Um, How do you I, get a I, ticket? I, excuse me? How do you get a ticket to, in particular, we're talking about can, but. Um, so you, you, yeah, you go on the website and you register and they're going to ask you a bunch of questions. You have to prove to them and they will check that you are a filmmaker or you are a distributor. You know, they'll ask you to list your credits. They'll ask you to put, you know, the, your website and they will check you out. And if you are an approved 
member of the industry, um, you can buy a pass. How and much you can buy they? passes for your employees as well. How much? Oh, uh, you know, it's funny. I believe it's 350 euros. That's not I too know. bad. So you can go to Berlin, Cannes, Tribeca, and South by Southwest. For the, oh, I'm sorry. And Toronto. All combined. For the cost of one good pass to Sundance. It's wow. cheap. Berlin's wow. the same way. I think Berlin is $290. Um, now, you know, and, and they, like everyone else, if, you know, they have the early bird specials and then the price goes up after two months and then the price gets, you know, a little bit higher, closer to the dates. But it's relatively inexpensive to go. Your your biggest price ticket is your the place to stay. And the airfare. And like, your plane I mean, ticket, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Let's just say, in theory, I'm done with my film, uh, this new film, Heroes of Carentown, by next, by this December, let's say. Shot in the dark, but let's say. And I've got, you know, Sundance coming up. Then there is Berlin. Then there is Cannes. Then there is, you know, all the other ones. And I really want somebody to to buy it, take it seriously, et cetera. What would you recommend I do? Um, if it's, if it's, even if it's in rough cut stage, my recommendation is you, you get it into the Berlin market and the Cannes market and, and it costs you, I don't know what it costs for Berlin, but I'm sure it's the same as it is Cannes, somewhere around 1500 euros to have your film shown. Um, I think it's 2000 euros. I have it shown multiple times. Um, but then what's more important is you have to find someone that is on the ground there. Um, and it, it could be yourself, um, but you, sh you need to be associated with a company to do that. Because um, if you're not, then, you know, it's, it's not that you're not respected, but you don't, you don't look as polished as, you know, you have a company representing you. So, so therefore, Joe from Germany or or from Scandinavia goes in and sees the movie. Who do they call when they walk out of that theater? There has to be an established company to call and not an individual. So basically, if I'm understanding you, you really if, if you're a U.S. filmmaker listening to this podcast, they've made a film and. They want to, you know, try to get their film at any one of these film markets. The first thing they probably should do is try to connect with a distributor and say, hey, A, are you interested in this film? And B, would you be willing to represent me at these markets? Yeah? Yeah. Yes. And the third thing that I recommend to any filmmaker watching this podcast, and I'm going to be very blunt about this, it is much more important if you are an independent filmmaker to visit and be a part of these markets than it is to play film festivals all over the country. I was, that was actually going to be my next question because what I have discovered is that the film festival is like this sea filled with piranhas and what they want is they want your money and they are using you as a draw. They want your film so they can take in tickets and they can be a thing. But ultimately, these days, unless you're at Sundance, Toronto, you know, South by Southwest or whatever, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in a film festival. And even those film festivals, typically now, the films have been sold before they even get to those film festivals. And yeah. so uh, that's where I have been kind of in my process. And that's where I'm going, that if we have money to spend, if we're going to market our film and try to get it somewhere, it seems to make a lot more sense to me to connect with a distributor early and spend your money going to the festivals that matter to sell your film. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, it's, it's really up to the filmmaker. If, if, if Mr. or Ms. Filmmaker, you want to stand on a stage and have your film get a standing ovation and do a Q and A and and you know use that ego builder and it is um, I've done it and I loved it absolutely loved it and um, that's great and and that's okay 
And there's nothing wrong with that. You can do that all over the country, especially if you can get film festivals to pay your way. But if you're looking to sell your movie and you're looking to raise money and get into a point where you're making revenue on the title of payback, the investors, then those film festivals aren't going to do anything for you. But being in a film market and walking around and trying to sell your film to countries all over the all over the world and being a part of the industry and you're you're meeting people all day long you're meeting people at dinner you're meeting people at parties you're meeting people that do what you do from all over the world i mean it's great to stand there and all of a sudden you start talking to somebody and and they're from dublin and they've made a movie or they're from uh, berlin or switzerland and they've made a movie i have friends from austria from france from london from dublin and I talk to them all the time because you never know what those, where, where those opportunities are um, or what those opportunities are going to bring you. Now, you could say the same thing about film festivals here in the United States. They, you know, but, but they're only attended by the filmmakers who have movies that are showing. Yes. So, you know, it's, it's not bank breaking. That's the first thing. It's not bank breaking. Um, but if you add up – so, for example – like, as I've been scrutinizing this last year, my social media timeline is filled with pictures of me on stage, with pictures holding awards, with tons of people, lots of affirmation, quotes from everybody. It is an ego builder. And for especially for somebody who's never done anything before, yeah. I think that people actually want to watch your film. And the first time I went to film festivals, I was like, oh my gosh, I met my people. Like, and all of that was great. I, I really am thankful for that experience. And it's true. I've met a ton of people that I've now networked with and connected with and I'm doing things with. And so there is value there. I don't want to dismiss that. Um, and there I have film festivals that pay my way, you know, which was beautiful. But but here I am on the other side. I've made a movie that I have not made any money back on, still 50000 in the hole. And so what I know I care about is can I sell this film, especially for the next one? Like, how can I become a filmmaker that actually makes a profit? I mean, imagine that. And I think that you're onto something. If I took all of that money that I spent doing all of that stuff, travel and DCPs and marketing and et cetera, et cetera, I could have easily given you ton, you know, whatever money you needed and paid my own way and my own lodging and, and gone to a film market and maybe sold it already. Very possible. So that would be our advice to you if you are in the middle of making a film. Joe, I've asked you several times, would you be interested in talking to filmmakers, narrative or documentary, um, who have a thing? And your answer always has been? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll talk to any filmmaker. We'll watch anything that is sent to us. We will be brutally honest about it. Um uh, and in particular about the possibilities of bringing in some revenue and what kind of revenue. And um, and we're also very honest about the market and what we're going through right now and what we are going to continue to go through for a, a while now. The strike um, <laughs> hasn't made it any easier. And the impending Directors Guild strike, which will be followed by SAG going on strike. Who knows? It's gonna so, be a rough year, that's for sure. Oh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a really rough year. Yeah, this um, is, this is the first time we're actually facing a tri guild strike, right? Yeah, like, I don't think it's ever happened before. Yeah, that's after, crazy. After COVID, I, yeah, and yeah, after COVID, and and here's what surprises me the most, and this is this is to any filmmaker that's watching this. Every week, and this happens every week, either myself or my partner Tim will get a phone call from a filmmaker or a email from a filmmaker about their new film. And we'll say to them, I think this movie is a perfect fit for any of the streamers. And uh, please make sure you send it to, you know, if we do a deal, can you get it up on Netflix or Hulu? And then you proceed to try to tell them what's been happening at all of these accounts for the past year. And they've never heard this before. They're, they're, they're clueless to the own industry that they are in. And I've said this, and I think I've said this on previous podcasts, you have to read the trades. You have to subscribe to Variety. 
and Deadline, uh, Deadline Hollywood, and The Hollywood Reporter, and IndieWire. If it costs you $200 a year, it's well worth it. You're going to get an email every day with a new edition. You have to stay up with the trades. If you don't, you're going to be lost. And distributors, including us, are getting very, very frustrated with trying to explain to a filmmaker that Netflix's stock dropped by 50% in the past year, and they're unaware of it. Yeah, yeah. It, it's amazing that, that um, did, you know, did you know that there is no HBO anymore? It's now called Max? Well, what do you mean there's no HBO? I, it's fine. Well, I think filmmakers are, and I'm, I'm one, so I can say this. I think we're very myopic in that we really are only focused on what we want to make, typically. What we want to make, what our creativity, the story we want to put out in the world um, I think the same is true for actors, same is true for writers. You know, you aren't taught the business side of things, truthfully, in film school or when you're coming along. And it's the real wake up call of the world where a distributor, like you, says, you're not paying attention to the trades. You shouldn't even be in this business where you're like, what is he talking about? So I do think that's a huge lesson from you, Joe, that people really should wake up and listen to. Yeah, it's it's really an education and it's an ongoing education. and. You know, if you're if you're a filmmaker, you know, again, there should be teachers or courses taught that, you know, that are called what to do with your film after you've made it. Um, I'm very fortunate. I know what to do with it. But that's been my part of the business. Um, but it's it's just and I'm not talking about first time filmmakers either. I'm yeah. talking about people that have made, you know, or somebody will call up and say, you know, I, you know, can you re re-release my film? It's been on. Netflix, and then it went to Hulu, and then it's been out on iTunes for five years, and they just don't understand. You know, it's it's a constant education, and you know things are changing in this business almost every day. Yeah, and well, you so and you just have to keep up with it. So we want to do a part two. We still haven't figured out what you learned from Can lessons, sure. you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna wrap this one up and. Uh, try to find a time to talk to you about part two. Okay. Sounds good.